The media have been in overdrive, discussing all the things Prince Harry has been saying in his recent interviews, and some have been discussing the way he's been saying them. In this video, I'll look at a few of the claims that have been made, and what they show us about how the media can sometimes treat speech and language. I'm going to break this into four assumptions or attitudes that I think quite often characterise the media's approach to speech and language. It's obvious, it's anything, it's bad, and it's because. This is the idea that the facts of speech and language are available to anyone and don't need any trained or professional backup. So we have the media asserting or insinuating quite strong claims about Harry's speech and language. But often the headlines that fuel people's imaginations are backed up with nothing more than tweets. I'm not sure this happens to the same extent with, say, health issues or weather events. When it comes to speech and language, it often seems that many people don't even know expertise is a thing. I sometimes think we phoneticians and linguists have done a pretty terrible job of letting the world know we actually exist. In a sense, this is the opposite of it's obvious. At the same time as assuming that speech and language are so transparent that you don't need a specialist's opinion, there can be a paradoxical readiness to suspend disbelief and accept claims that are at odds with what is obvious. For example, some years ago people were suddenly willing to accept the idea that Queen Elizabeth sounded cockney. The Queen no longer speaks the Queen's English and is instead starting to sound like a cockney, new research has revealed. This was the hyperbolic reporting of a famous article showing that the Queen had shifted a few of her more old-fashioned vowels in the direction of what the authors called SSB, Standard Southern British. The main change, lowering the vowel in the word trap, was nothing to do with Cockney, and the Queen still obviously sounded very posh. I don't know whether the journalists believed their own headlines or not, but I encountered people who had swallowed this and believed that in some parallel reality the Queen somehow sounded Cockney. Native English speakers also have a habit of exaggerating anything they notice, like the commenter on one of my videos who said that I have a strong North of England accent. I'm sorry, but if you think the Queen sounded cockney or that I have a strong Northern accent, not that it would be a bad thing if I did, then your listening skills could do with a bit of work. I think most native speakers on both sides of the Atlantic, if they aren't willingly deafened by their bias, can hear perfectly well that Harry has a British accent. His speech is overwhelmingly SSB. To mention just a few features that make SSB different from General American, he has bath broadening throughout in words like after, last, ask. Especially the last six years. The last... He's non-rhotic, so he never pronounces a r sound in words like sort and harm. Potentially cause harm to my family. Harm. But he does occasionally have so-called intrusive R. Par and Camilla. Par and Camilla. He sometimes uses ejectives, which are more a British than an American thing. Would be therapeutic. And very occasionally he even has TH fronting, which nowadays is a fairly general British phenomenon. And there was open willingness on both sides. On both sides. Up talk, the rising intonation on a statement observed by the tweeters, isn't a uniquely American feature. I really look forward to having that family element back. I look forward to having a relationship with my brother and other members of my family. It's been well established in Britain for years. Ribeiro was painting in Naples um, during the 17th century. The decisions in that lead up process helps ground everyone. I've tried to get it right over the last sort of six or seven months to a year. T voicing, pronouncing a T more like a D, I don't see it as cutting at all, is also used in Britain, though to a much lesser extent than in North America. It's something Harry's done for years. It was, for me, personally better. Personally better. And which his brother and even his father sometimes do. It's quite a, it's quite a moment. It's quite a, it's quite a moment. In 1947. 1947. As I said in my previous video on the King and his sons, Harry may well be doing tea voicing more now than he used to. I certainly did when I lived in the US. But for someone who's been living there for years, Harry's British accent is notably intact. 
it's easy to find examples of Brits whose accents really have Americanized. I'm in Carefree, Arizona. We've been here since March 15. We looked at the world. You know, we have homes in New Zealand. We have homes in New York and in Arizona. And we felt... We have to be able to address kind of economic empowerment. We have to be able to address education and employment for girls and women globally and in this country too. Let me know in the comments if you'd like me to make a video on the so-called mid or transatlantic accent. This is value judgment, the all too common claim or assumption that the speech and language features under discussion are bad, wrong, ugly, mistaken, sinister, you name it. I think every one of the tweets quoted above about Harry's speech came from people who don't much like him or his wife. This kind of bias alone tends to cast doubt on what people have to say. The media items on Harry contain negatively charged words like fake, pseudo, and of course, drawl. The word drawl, which has sound symbolic associations with words like crawl and drool, isn't really a precise phonetic term. It is occasionally used to refer to vowel diphthongization in traditional US southern accents. Listen for that diphthong, that short vowel sound followed by that, that slight schwa sound. Hat, pet. Sit. But the word tends to be used either disdainfully or patronizingly, and British journalists' notion of a Californian drawl was derided in social media, presumably by Americans. When Harry used the non-British pronunciation route in his interview with Anderson Cooper, I need to ride the same route. Even the relatively thoughtful and restrained Guardian reacted with alarm and hyperbole. Pronouncing root in the American way to rhyme with shout, the prince will have to watch where his accent ends up, with signs of it splashing into mid-Atlantic. But his route pronunciation doesn't even constitute a change in his accent. He's just choosing an American form of a word for an American audience. And that's confirmed a bit later in the same interview when he says the British windscreen followed immediately by windshield. They cleared the, winds, the windscreen, the windshield. A small clarification for American viewers. I do exactly this kind of thing in my videos. Aquaman or Aquaman in America the region of the palate we call post-alveolar. Americans generally pronounce it post-alveolar. One example is YYZ or YYZ by the Canadian rock band Rush. Again, Harry's occasional use of uptalk is treated as a bad thing, when it probably wouldn't even be noticed from other speakers now that it's as common as it is in Britain and elsewhere. There's a chapter on British uptalk in my book, and if you'd like a video on the subject, let me know. In the same way, it's suggested that Harry's use of the tag right is coercive and or suspiciously American. But it's a common way in Britain as in America of checking that your listener understands you. I mean, I think that's yeah. what editing is, right? Knowledge is different from ice cream, right? The topic of today is rain, right? And this is why it can be used on if clauses, which aren't even assertions. If this is the real world, right? And even if Harry is accommodating to American English, there aren't really any explanations as to why this would be so bad. Did many people complain about, say, Cary Grant being subverted by Americanisms? Or using them to get audiences on his side? And when the Queen started to sound cockney, nobody seemed that bothered about it, and I don't think anyone accused her of being under malign influence. Which brings us to assumption four. This is the assumption that features of speech or language are not just part of life's rich tapestry, but rather because of some cause like an individual's personality, or a stereotypical social or national characteristic, or in Harry's case, the narrative that he's under the spell of his wife. I haven't studied Meghan Markle's speech in any depth. I simply don't know if she uses the tag right more than many other Americans and Brits. But I didn't notice Harry using it when he was interviewed by the American Anderson Cooper. If I missed it, please let me know. Where I did notice Harry using it was in the interview with the Englishman Tom Bradby. Bradby's older than Harry, but they've known each other a long time. They both went to posh schools and they have the same basic accent. And when speaking to each other, they both use the tag right. You talk about being buoyed by his praise, mm -hmm. right? Shaking people's hands, smiling. I've seen the videos, right? Which you constantly or frequently reference, mm -hmm. right? We were on different paths. 
right? The truth is more nuanced and all the rest of it, right? Well, the truth supposedly at the moment has been there's only one side to this story, right? So is there anything sensible and evidence-based that can be said about Harry's speech compared with how it used to be? Well, he seems more colloquial, less formal than in some of his earlier interviews. He adapts to his situation and he's aware of lexical differences between Britain and the US. But in my opinion, he shows notably little Americanization for someone who's lived there for years. Probably the main thing that struck me in the interviews is how articulate he is, especially compared with how his father and brother sometimes speak. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen, the whole of the common common. First of all, I just want to say, first of all, I just want to say, first of all, I just want to say, but the moment I'm, but the moment I'm, but the moment I'm, Manchester, Manchester. But of course, the real reason that Harry is so articulate is because.